My earliest memory is being sexually abused by my great uncle at a family reunion. I was four years old. I remember going into my first day of kindergarten and already the thought of wishing I could commit suicide was there for me at five. We had a friend of the family. He would take us to his house and sexually abuse both me and my sister. As a child, you don't know what the rules are. You know, you don't know what the laws are. You don't know, you know, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. You just know what you feel. I didn't tell a living soul about the sexual abuse I suffered. He was a man that was trapped by his demons. He was a man that made some horrible mistakes. He was just too scared to face what he had done. You're dying to tell somebody, but you're also terrified of somebody finding out. And now the big winner, Miss Colorado, crowned by last year's Miss America. She is Madeline Vandeburg of Denver. I grew up in the picture-perfect family. I was called the debutante Miss America. I was the first Miss America that they ever brought a family up on stage. We want you to meet America. We want you to meet the Vandiver family. These are the four beautiful daughters and the mother and the father because we were a picture-perfect family. Incest in our family? Who would have even thought of the word in the 1950s? He started coming into my room when I was five. And the one thing that I knew as a child is that there was no hope for me of it stopping. What I wanted to my father's death was his daytime love, and I never got that. I just got him at night, and that's all I had, and that's all I had to cling to. A pedophile's gonna be around children. That's what he wants to be, is around children. So. He's going to be a priest. He's going to be a Boy Scout leader. He's going to be a teacher. I went to a school in downtown Charleston where I was molested by a teacher there over many years. If you met Fisher, you'd probably think of him like my parents thought, like my sister. He had a Porsche. She was funny. He was fast. He was whatever he knew you wanted him to be so that you'd be comfortable. I was cleaning out the bathroom. It was my day to do the chores, and my father came home drunk. He ordered me to turn around. I don't know how I got out, when he stopped, but I, it seemed like forever. When your parent is telling you that it's okay for them to sexually abuse you, it's okay for me to be in there, then reality is being completely distorted. Father Jim had a natural field of cultivating victims. He had the complete deference of his entire community. He had a position of great authority. Father Jim knew everyone's darkest secrets. And Father Jim had grades one through eight in his backyard. All the Catholic school kids right there in the playground next to his house. I am the fifth of seven children, and I'm the third boy. So when it was time for me to become an altar boy in second grade, it wasn't a choice. It was time. It was something, you know, to be proud of. And it was something uh, also that, you know, set me up for attack. 
my father was actually very close friends with Father Jim. Now I know why. Father Jim was very close friends with my father. My father told him what a loving kid I was and how affectionate I was and how I kissed my father goodnight every night. And that allowed Father Jim to say, you know, why don't you kiss me? Now this is my priest. I'm alone with him. I'm sitting in his lap. He's manipulated me for months and had this casual, sensual contact with me. I was powerless to say no to something like that. For me to be a 10-year-old child and have a 37-year-old man place his tongue in my mouth, his fat, fleshy tongue, was an experience of tremendous trauma. I think it's so hard for people because they see like somebody my age talking about this. And so you, you picture me. But no, it was, you know, a nine-year-old. I mean, I've since become really good friends with another person who was going through that. And he thought he was the only one. I mean, we used to have dinner, like four of us, at Fisher's house on Tuesday nights. And I mean, I'd get to Fisher's at, he'd, I'd go home from school with them, go upstairs for 45 minutes, come downstairs 30 minutes before people came over for dinner. But my friend couldn't imagine that what happened to him up there happened to me, because it was just too insane. Growing up, all I remember was violence and fear. It was not a happy time. That's why at 14, I wanted to kill myself, because I hadn't even told. All I knew is that I could not bear to be in that house with him. And so I was like the invisible child that I did all the right things, and if I just stay invisible, I won't get hit. And if I stay invisible, he won't come in the bathroom. I was uh, about 11 or 12. And my father always came in late at night. Late meaning 10, 11, sometimes midnight. And he'd been in my room for maybe a half hour. And all of a sudden, I, I heard footsteps coming down. My mother wore, uh, they're called mules. They're, it's a dressy bedroom slipper with, with a heel on it. So as she started down the steps, which were linoleum, I could hear the first step and then the second step very, very, very slowly, and then the third step. Everything stopped for all three of us. All three of us knew exactly what each one of us was thinking and knew. It's the only time I ever felt my father afraid. He, he just stopped. And I thought, it's going to be over. She's going to come in. And then I heard a step up the steps and up the steps and up the steps. And I knew she would never, ever come to help me. I believe she made a choice, and she didn't choose me. One of the reasons I didn't want to go to my father's funeral was because he didn't try to rekindle the relationship. It was like, okay, you did all this stuff when I was growing up, but you still could have came back. You still could have picked up the telephone. He, he was never going to be able to be a father to me, but we could have been, uh, we could have had a relationship. We could have sung together. I remember just being in church. I wanted to sing with him. He had the most incredible voice, and that's what made me sad was that I would have wanted to sing with him. Um, and he didn't even come to me. He didn't know me well enough to know, just to pick up the telephone or to say, why don't you come to church with me? But he did have some things, and he was a man that was trapped by his demons. He was a man that made some horrible mistakes. He was just too scared to face what he had done. I never repressed the memories of my sexual abuse, but I worked damn hard to suppress them and forget about them because I thought it was a lot easier to forget about it and not deal with it than try to make sense of it all. I was at college on the campus of the University of Notre Dame, good Catholic university, and I read this story about this priest who was being prosecuted for sexually abusing children. 
Uh, I almost dropped off this park bench. Because at that very moment, casually reading a story in the newspaper, I transformed in my own perception from confused to victim. It was at that moment that I realized I was the victim of a crime. I could put a label on it. I was sexually abused. It, it was startling, overwhelming. But I didn't have a press conference. I didn't go to the police. I didn't tell everyone I knew. I kept it quiet because my perpetrator was still pushing my buttons to do so. So I went to my bishop and I told him all about the sexual assaults that I had suffered for all those years. He was bound by the law to report it to the police and my bishop chose not to. And that causes me pain to this day that I had a chance to walk down to the police station and report him and get him put behind bars and I lost out on that chance because I turned to my bishop to fix it and he did not. You're dying to tell somebody, but you're also terrified of somebody finding out. It's like holding a beach ball underwater, and that's what it is. I mean, you're, you can't wait to let it go, but you're holding the world together as much as you can. It was all that far under the surface, but I made it. But it, for 30 seconds, I came, at, came to and said, this has just got to end. I'm going to treatment. It took a while to... Because it's like if you stop drinking, you have to feel. And if I feel, then I'll crack up. And that was sort of this, that was the low point. And then I sort of slowly but surely put it back together. When I was 39, I went into physical paralysis and was unable to move. I, my head would work, but my body wouldn't work. And finally, I, I didn't know what else to do. So finally, at age 40, I went into therapy. And I began to start dealing with what had happened to me from age 5 to age 18. I called my father at his office and said, I need to talk to you. Terror would not have even begun to approach the feeling I had of talking to him about this. I was terrorized. He came in and sat down. I had notes. And I said, um, this is the most difficult thing I've ever done. And he said, I'll be back in a minute. And he got up, and he went up the winding staircase, which was right outside the door, He two by two, up the staircase, his bedroom right at the front of the staircase. I waited for a toilet to be flushed. I waited for a phone call to be made. He came back immediately. I, I didn't think he had a gun. I absolutely 100% knew he had a gun in his pocket. I knew that. I knew he could kill me or himself or both of us. But you know what? You can die a day at a time. You can just die a day at a time, or you can just say, you know what, I am going to do this. My father never denied anything. He said, if I had known what it would do to you, I never would have done it. And I left there thinking, he wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have done it. I just, I, gr I grabbed onto that. If he'd known, he wouldn't have. He just really didn't know. He didn't know, he wouldn't have. And then, however many years later, I confronted him when I was 40, and I got the letter when I was 56. So 16 years later, I get a letter from a woman who writes to me and in such detail. There is no doubt that my father sexually violated her when he was 74. He died when he was 75. He never stopped. He never stopped. He knew exactly what he was doing. He didn't care what it did to anyone. He absolutely knew what it did to me. It mattered not to him. That's what I've learned. Though you can't see blood, there still is actual damage. In sexual abuse of children, doesn't just create bad memories. The sexual abuse of children creates extremely damaged lives. So it has been a long journey to break through that wall of denial. It took counseling. It took the support of my wife. It took for her to challenge me, challenge my thinking, challenge the way I acted in relationships. The effects of sexual abuse 30 years ago 
still manifest themselves as if the abuse happened today? I don't think people have a clue that this permeates your life the way it does. I remember sitting in that courtroom and to hear the same story from somebody 52, 48, 36, 27, then a lawyer speaking for the 14-year-old. I mean, Fisher had 39 victims, and some of them it was two or three times. And when I first heard them, I was like lightweight. I mean, I really was, you know. But there's no Richter scale. When my father was abusing, sexually abusing me, and when he was beating on me, and when he was beating on my mother, what you get robbed of is being able to discern danger. I was afraid to uh, disagree with somebody. I was the most agreeable person. He helped me become a perfect doormat. I was scared of everybody. People did not know how scared I was as an adult. I just, and in fact, they saw me so confident. They said, Donna, why were you so, you, you seemed so confident. I was just, I, fear was my middle name. People see me now, and I'm like crouching tiger, hidden dragon. I'll kick your butt. But back then, mm -mm, I was so scared. You live a, a lifetime of isolation because you keep so much of yourself private because you believe, because I believed, as almost every sexual abuse survivor believes, if you knew this about me, you would never want to speak to me again. You ought to try telling someone that you love and that you're not who he has believed that you've been all these years. And I couldn't even raise my head. I could never have looked Larry in the eye to try to tell him that I'm not who you think I am at all. I'm a really bad person. I don't know what words I used, but when he, I don't, and I don't know how he ever could have put it together, but he just came over and just took me in his arms and he just said, I understand everything now. I understand everything now. When I finally got my chance to tell my story and broke through that wall of silence and shame and guilt, and I smashed through it, one of the most amazing calls of my life happened that day, which was from my best friend who said, I am so proud of you. I read the newspaper. I am so proud that you've told this story because Father Jim sexually abused me too. And I've never told a soul until I'm calling you now. Healing from sexual abuse is a lifelong process. One is not survived, one survives over time, hopefully. And then transferring from surviving to thriving is a whole other challenge. But it takes a lot of work. The amazing thing is there were all these parents who were powerful and had plenty of money and, you know, could call the big lawyers. And they were chicken. Whereas, you know, the tomato farmer from Johns Island in the beat up old pickup on the side of the road, what can I do? And so to talk about my father, to know that, to know that he was willing to stand up for me, it gave me that gave me the room to be okay to stand up for myself. What gives me hope is it has worked out. And if it's worked out this far, then it's gonna be okay. And if it can be okay for me, it can be okay. When I think about stopping child sexual abuse, I think about a trip I took to Gettysburg three years ago. I was blown away by what it took to stop the institution of slavery. Everyone from the president to the military to the legislator to the lowliest slave got involved. They got a conscience. They stopped the abuse. The same thing needs to happen to stop child sexual abuse. Everyone is going to have to get involved. Everyone is going to have to get a conscience. 
All you have to do, if you lose hope, you walk the field to Gettysburg. I found myself saying at Jennifer's wedding, this is the happiest day of my life, which I'm sure Larry must have thought, well, wasn't our <laughs> wedding day, and Jennifer must have thought wasn't my birth, but her wedding day was the happiest day of my life because it was that day that I realized, watching her husband Joel with his family and watching Joel reacting with Jennifer, she had chosen someone so much like Larry. She had chosen a loving, kind, funny, nurturing husband. I knew by the man she married that I had broken the chain of abuse, of abuse on my branch of the tree forever. You can do something right now to protect the children in your life. Contact Darkness to Light to get the five steps to protecting our children or to learn about training programs for your community. It's that important. If you're a survivor of child sexual abuse or someone who wants to learn more, Darkness to Light can help.